So I see more than 100 of you have already joined us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Laura Cecchi Galanos. I am the executive manager of the World Stroke Academy, the educational platform of the World Stroke Organization, which provides stroke education to health professionals worldwide. Now, it is with great pleasure that we are hosting the first webinar of 2024, uh, an educational activity on primary angitis of the central nervous system, an over-suspected and underdiagnosed cerebrovascular disease. We have exceptional speakers that agreed to share their expertise on the topic with us today. As per usual, before introducing our moderator and speakers, we will have a quick look at some of our housekeeping rules. We welcome any questions that you might have throughout the webinar, but we kindly ask you to use the Q&A box for those in your Zoom control panel. You can, of course, use the chat box to say hi or tell us where you're joining us from today. We have also prepared some polls for you um, before and after the presentation, so please participate in those. A reminder that the webinar is recorded and that the recording link will be sent out to you via email shortly after the webinar and it will also be uploaded on the World Shook Academy site and our YouTube channel. And lastly, we kindly invite you to fill in the evaluation survey, which will pop up on your screen um, at the end of the webinar, so you can share your feedback with us, as well as suggestions for future webinars. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's moderators, Dr. Alexandra Mutili from the Department of Medicine, St. Michael's Hospital, University of Toronto, Canada, and Professor Brett Cucchiara from the Department of Neurology at the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, USA. Thank you both very much for being with us here today, and uh, the floor is all yours. Great. So thank you to the WSA for inviting me to co-chair this webinar on a topic that is near and dear to me, and I'm sure of great interest to all of you as well. Um, our first presentation will feature a combined talk from Maria Luisa Zed, who will discuss the ESO guidelines towards a standardization of a clinical neurovascular approach. And this will be followed by Rosario Pascarella, who will present on the differential diagnosis with clues and clinical examples from an integrated neurological and neuroradiological perspective. We will start with a couple of polls. So poll number one, does normal CSF findings exclude primary angitis of the central nervous system? So please take a couple of seconds to answer the poll. Good, so 93% said no. Let's move on to the second question. The second question is, does a normal MRA exclude large vessel primary angitis of the central nervous system? The answer options are yes, no, and only when done on a three Tesla MRI. And so here again, the majority, 70% responded no. We'll have the answers of these throughout the talk. Okay, question number three, is any of the parenchymal and vascular markers on neuroradiology, um, including vessel wall imaging, highly specific for primary angitis of the CNS? A great poll question and something we face commonly in clinical practice. So 66% said no, 18% said yes, and 16% said with vessel wall imaging. And then there's one more question. When MRA or CTA findings are normal, is a DSA recommended? The 
Okay, so the majority said yes, um, and a couple of people said no, and, and some said only in patients with stroke. So that's the, the end of our first four poll questions, and now we'll turn it over to the speakers to present their talk. Good afternoon. As you can see in the slide, this is a joint presentation. I'm Maria Luisa Zed. I am a neurologist, a vascular neurologist, and I work in Stroke Unit in Reggio Emilia, in the northern part of Italy. Uh, my co-presenter is uh, Dr. Rosario Pascarella, is a neuroradiologist, and he works in the same hospital. We are going to present the ESOPA CNS guidelines from the neurological and neuroradiological point of view in order to standardize the diagnostic approach. PACNS or primary angiitis of the central nervous system is a rare subtype of vasculitis involving only CNS, brain, leptomeninges, and spine. It's a rare disease without sex prevalence and with a median age of diagnosis of 8 years. Two different sets of diagnostic criteria were proposed by Calabres and Malik in 1988 and by Birman and Elman in 2009. The diagnosis and the management of PACNS is a challenge for several reasons. The definite diagnosis requires histopathology, but we have to carefully check the risk benefit ratio of a biopsy, uh, considering also the possibility of a negative biopsy or a um, false negative finding. The increasing availability of uh, non invasive or minimally invasive techniques for diagnosis is not considered in the diagnostic criteria, so they are not updated and uh, the presenting symptoms uh, and the finding uh, of non-invasive investigation are not specific. So diagnosis is the first challenging step. Many issues about diagnosis and management of PACNS are not standardized and the evidence is very low. The learning objectives of this presentation are the following ones. First, to highlight the limitation of the current diagnostic criteria of PACNS to think uh, about the subtypes uh, of uh, PACNS, large vessel versus small vessel PACNS, large vessel including large and medium uh, size vessels, to consider the strength and limitations of each diagnostic technique used in clinical practice. And finally, uh, last but not least, to support the standardization of a dedicated approach from a neurovascular point of view, including vascular neurologists and neuroradiologists. The guideline of the European Stroke Organization about PACNS were recently developed in order to address this limitation and the lack of evidence uh, guiding clinical practice. The P of the PICO is probable and definite PACNS uh, according to the Birman and Delman criteria. 17 PICOS were developed, including diagnostic and therapeutic PICOS. The diagnostic PICOS were on uh, CSF, neuroimaging, and histopathology. And the therapeutic PICOS addressed uh, disease-specific treatment, uh, acute treatment and maintenance therapy, secondary prevention, and acute stroke treatment in patients with PACNS. And this is the final publication of our guideline. PICO-1 is about the role of uh, CSF analysis for pleocytosis and hyperproteinorachia, about uh, PACNS uh, diagnosis, according to the criteria proposed by Birman and Elman. We developed an epidemic recommendation, but there is a persistent uncertainty over the utility of CSF examination, both for PACNS diagnosis and for uh, differentiation between large vessel and small vessel PACNS. This is due to several reasons, for example, the lack of specific comparative studies and the heterogeneity of data um, regarding both diagnostic procedures and uh, cohorts and population in developed studies. But quality of evidence and strength of recommendation uh, are not accessible. Uh, but uh, for uh, practical reasons, uh, the modular working group suggests uh, that CSF examination is uh, fundamental during the diagnosis workup, but to exclude uh, other diseases, for example, post-infectious vasculitis. And uh, uh, it is recommended to do not limit CSF analysis to 
protein and cells. And uh, uh, normal CSF analysis cannot exclude diagnosis of PACMS. 17 papers were considered for the analysis, providing data on 763 PACNS patients. 77% of patients under one lumbar puncture, and uh, the rate of positive CSF findings was 77%. Different studies used different thresholds for hyperprotonorachia, for example, above 45 or above 50 or above 80 mg per deciliters. A recent study evaluating total CSF protein levels in healthy subjects in a community-based population documented mean CSF protein 52 mg per deciliter. PICO2 is about neuroimaging for brain parenchyma. In particular, does assessing for the predefined patterns of parenchymal abnormalities using MRI versus not assessing them increase the diagnostic accuracy. Uh, unfortunately, there is a persistent uncertainty regarding the clinical utility of assessing these patterns, and in particular of using this pattern to differentiate between a small vessel from large vessel PACMS. And the reporting and lack of specific comparative studies are the main limitations. So in practical uh, words, in adults with uh, definite or probable PACNS, the suggestion is to report neurovision findings in a standardized way uh, using the already described pattern of parenchymal involvement and contrast enhancement uh, in order to collect uh, prospectively relevant data. Uh, given the potential selection bias in patients undergoing biopsy, um, we suggest to be cautious in attributing some patterns, for example, to mefactic pattern or hemorrhagic pattern to small vessel or large vessel PACNS. We defined seven new imaging patterns, hemorrhagic pattern to mefactic pattern, multiple single acute or subacute ischemic lesions, small vessel disease pattern, uh, the pattern of parenchymal contrast enhancement and the rare spinal cord involvement. Uh, 18 studies were considered, providing data on uh, 660 patients enrolled in a wide time range. And uh, these data were uh, heterogeneous and reporting of many of the key features were largely incomplete. Uh, this reflects uh, the retrospective design of the studies, but also the lack of a pre-planned standardized diagnostic workup involving neuroradiologists and vascular neurologists. With this limitation, no neuroimaging pattern, uh, including tomefactic PACNS, was reported to be indicative of a single subtype of PACNS. And uh, uh, we strongly highlight that uh, the pre-biopsy parenchyla enhancement uh, was uh, a selection bias uh, for uh, identifying patients undergoing biopsy. PICO4 is again on neuroimaging, in particular comparing CTA or MRA with hyperprobability pattern versus DSA with hyperprobability pattern for diagnostic accuracy. We don't recommend using MRI routinely in place of DSA uh, with a very low quality of evidence, but a strong level of recommendation against intervention. And no recommendation can be drawn for CTA because uh, its clinical utility has not been formally compared in PAC in a patient uh, with MRI and DSA. Uh, we suggest that uh, CTA could be comparable to MRI using multi-detector techniques. DSA has a higher sensitivity specificity for medium sized vessel, and uh, this is the main limitation of MRA. Uh, we suggest uh, to consider DSA in patients with clinical suspicion of PACNS and a negative finding on MRA before considering them for, for a biopsy. The recommendation and the statements were der derived from five papers collecting a total amount of 108. 86 patients with PACNS. 58% of patients underwent DSA and 65% underwent MRA or CTA. A single study performed on a subset of a French cohort directly compared the MRA acquired at 1.5 and 3 Tesla with DSA in 31 patients. The main limitation of this study relies in the per se segment comparison. Neither DSA or MRA were evaluated for the presence of a high probability pattern. Indeed, among 81% of patients with abnormal DSA findings, 
all but one had changed on 3D TOF MRA with a concordance of 0.82 between 1.5 MRA and DSA and 0.87 between 3 Tesla MR angiography and DSA. PICO-5 explored the subset of patients with negative findings on MRA in regard of the diagnostic accuracy of MRA versus DSA. The final recommendation was to perform a DSA if the MRA is normal with a very low quality of evidence and a strength of recommendation as weak for intervention. DSA has the highest spatial resolution, including the medium vessels, where MRA shows one of its main limitations. In the previously cited study from the French cohort, where the comparison was focused on stenosis and not on the high probability pattern, almost all false negative MRA, MRA segments could be defined as medium vessels. In addition, MRA had seven false positive segments too. It should be remarked that atherosclerosis is the main differential diagnosis in patients with multifocal involvement of large and medium vessels and DSA has the higher accuracy for evaluating the burden and pattern of involvement. Finally, two different subtypes of PACNS emerge according to the size of involved vessels, large vessel and small vessel PACNS. The first one includes large and medium vessels, and the second one refers to vessels with a diameter less than 250-500 micra, representing the limit of DSA resolution. The threshold of 750 micra for small vessel is based on the recent classification proposed on neurointerventional purposes. Medium vessel category lies in between 2 mm and 750 micra. DSA is the gold standard technique for vascular imaging in several diseases and in PACNS too. The main angiographic findings of PACNS are one or multiple segmental stenosis and or occlusion. Luminal irregularities of a normal straightening or kinking is a typical example. Localized dilation and beading. Clear advantages of DSA over any other other imaging technique are the superior temporal and spatial resolution for medium vessels. These techniques have some limitations, including a relatively low specificity for the theologic correlate of individual findings. Indeed, the laminal narrowing or stenosis on DSA might be attributed to different diseases because of the laminal irregularity is an indirect consequence of vessel wall pathology. This limitation might be partially compensated by evaluating the burden of findings. The true limitation of DSA is a spatial resolution. Impact and geographic abnormalities may be provoked by several pathological processes, including spasm, edema, cellular infiltration, proliferation of the vessel wall, compression of surrounding thickened meninges from exudate or fibrosis, weakening of all damaged vessel wall, and vasoparalysis. Since Calabres and Malek proposed the diagnostic criteria for PACNS, classic angiographic features of angitis within the CNS have been relied upon in many centers as a cornerstone of the diagnosis. This assumption could have limited the evaluation of several processes potentially responsible of the same findings in differential diagnosis. In the Birnbaum and the Hellman criteria mentioned the high probability angiographic change as a cornerstone for diagnosis. The high probability pattern includes alternating areas of smooth wall, segmental narrowing, and dilatation of cerebral arteries, arterial occlusions affecting many cerebral vessels, absence of proximal atherosclerosis or other recognized abnormalities. A single abnormality in several arteries or several abnormalities in a single artery were proposed as less consistent with the PACNS diagnosis. This approach is affected by the focus on differential diagnosis with RCVS only on the basis of imaging. As usual, the reality is more complex in differential diagnosis versus several diseases, including atherosclerosis. Among the DSA signs of vasculitis, stenosis is the most easily recognizable, and in particular when it's located in large proximal arteries. It's well imaged through DSA and MRA2 as in the example in the slide. 
it shows DSA on the left and MRA on the right, NAP view and maximum intensity projection sagittal view, a severe long tapered stenosis of the internal carotid artery terminus involving the M1 and the A1 segments. This is another example of DSA with the involvement of medium vessels. In lateral view, it's possible to identify a multifocal involvement on several branches, better detailed in a magnificent view with the red arrows pointing on the main stenosis in the ACA branches and in other view, the anterior choroidal artery branches. All the stenosis have a similar pattern with a long, irregularly tapering decrease of a vessel caliber. New technologies as a 3D rotational angiography with maximum intensity projection reconstruction allows to have even a better view on the multifocal medium vessel involvement, as in this sagittal reconstruction of the entire course of ACA along the medial aspect of the brain hemisphere. Some of the most evident stenosis are in distal trunk of the pericalosal artery and in some branches of the callosal marginal artery. Mild irregularities are also present in the laminal profile of the A2-ACA. Another typical angiographic sign of vasculitis is the simultaneous presence in the same vessel or in different vessels of stenosis and dilation, as in this slide, showing a long dilation of the PCA and a stenosis and subsequent dilation of the MCA branch. Beading, the sequential alternation of irregular stenosis and dilatation, is another angiographic sign of vasculitis, not only of the PACNS, and the present slide provides a good example of it on posterior cerebral artery. Before beading, a tubular stenosis is evident on the same artery. The inflammatory process in the vessel wall might also provoke occlusion. In the present slide, a chronic occlusion of A3, A4 of anterior cerebral artery is illustrated with a collateral bridging to overcome the occluded segment, as better evident in the magnified image. All images are sagittal reconstruction planes from 3D rotation angiography. It's not possible to highlight these findings with non-invasive techniques, and sometimes only medium vessel are involved in PACNS. PICO-6 is about the role of vessel wall image, and in particular the added diagnostic role of this technique in comparison with the DSA. After a careful check of the available evidence, the recommendation is the following one. In adults with the probable large vessel PACNS, there are insufficient data on high-resolution vessel wall imaging to determine whether the, the technique improves the diagnostic accuracy of a PACNS when used with DSA. Both the quality of evidence and the strength of a recommendation cannot be determined. Then, an expert consensus statement is needed, and the model working group agreed that the HRVWI is a promising but not yet validated technique, suggesting that it should be investigated and validated in prospective multicenter multi trials. In the meantime, its use should be limited to expert centers and the interpretation of a positive finding should not be the unique neuroimaging modality supporting the diagnosis of PCNS. Three papers were available for answering this question, collecting data on a total amount of 73 patients with PCNS, 40% with large vessel, between 2009 and 2020. In all cases, the vessel wall enhancement was the main finding and co-localized with the MRA DSA arterial stenosis when present. The vessel wall enhancement was concentric in 85-95% of the described cases, but there were insufficient data to assess for other high-resolution vessel wall derived biomarkers, including pre-contrast thickening and spontaneous T2 hyperintense signal of the vessel wall. The main limitation is a huge selection bias because the three studies collected only patients with high resolution vessel wall imaging performed without clear selection criteria. Then, the change in the PACNS and diagnostic accuracy due to high resolution vessel wall imaging remains unknown versus MRA, and no study provided adequate information regarding the change in diagnostic accuracy provided by high-resolution vessel wall imaging when compared with DSA. 
vessel wall MRI uses high resolution multiparametric MRI sequences to di directly visualize intracranial arterial walls through a suppression of both laminal blood signal and CSF signal. Intracranial vessels have often tortuosity and a 3D acquisition with isotropic voxels, allowing multiplanar reconstruction is of utmost importance to avoid partial volume artifacts. This is true for all applications of vessel wall imaging. One of the most important issues to pay attention when interpreting vessel wall imaging is to distinguish between physiological and pathological enhancement. The main source of physiological enhancement are vasovasorum. Intracranial vasovasorum are rare and develop with age, predominantly on the proximal portion of intracranial arteries. Moreover, they proliferate in patients with pathological conditions such as intracranial atherosclerosis, vasculitis, and aneurysm. In a very elegant study published on European radiology, the authors aimed to assess the extent of a vessel wall enhancement in normal subjects in order to highlight the role of vasovasorum. In particular, both the vertebral artery and internal carotid artery in their intradural course were examined finding that 91 and 30% of the patient had respectively vessel wall enhancement on VA and ICA almost always bilaterally. This issue should be carefully considered before defining vessel wall enhancement as pathological. In this slide are summarized the main findings of vessel wall imaging in patients with vasculitis. They are circumferential vessel wall thickening, smooth circumferential homogeneous vessel wall enhancement, it can be multifocal or diffuse, and it can extend beyond the vessel into the adhesion parenchyma, homogeneous vessel wall signal on T1 and T2 weighted sequences. One of the main issues limiting the application of vessel wall imaging in the diagnosis of vasculitis is that in the follow-up up to 10 years, persistence of vessel wall contrast enhancement was a frequent finding even with a healed disease. Therefore, vessel wall enhancement is not per se associated with clinical disease activity. Persisting vessel wall contrast enhancement could be caused by post-inflammatory mural fibrosis and or without neovascularization. PICO-9 is about the presence of MRI leptomeningeal enhancement versus positive biopsy in the diagnostic accuracy of PACNS. Also in this case, there is persistence uncertainty regarding the effect on diagnostic accuracy of the uh, LMA. Uh, the quality of evidence and the strength of recommendation are not accessible, and uh, although the very low quality of evidence, uh, the model working group suggested the proceeding to biopsy where there is a clinical suspicion of PACNS, uh, leptomeningeal enhancement, and normal finding on DSA, and to consider a targeted biopsy of gadolinium enhanced lesions uh, versus uh, blunt biopsy when there is not a leptomeningeal enhancement. These recommendations were derived from two descriptive cohorts, uh, collecting data on 203 patients where leptomeningeal enhancement were reported in 60.3% of patients. The low, le low level of evidence uh, uh, depends on two main limitations. Information regarding gadolinium based contrast agents administration is not provided in our studies, and in patients with leptomeningeal enhancement and positive biopsy, we don't have information about the location of the sample, whether the biopsy was guided uh, on a leptomeningeal enhancement, and uh, whether the biopsy collected the meningeal and of brain tissues, and so on. Finally, two different subtypes of PACN emerge large and medium vessel involvement and small vessel involvement. These different subtypes have different diagnostic findings on neuroimaging, and uh, most importantly, these different subtypes may have an overlapping zone uh, determined by the involvement of medium vessel, uh, which can be uh, diagnosed also in the small vessel subtype. And finally, a PICO about treatment, in particular, acute phase treatment uh, using glucocorticoids plus any further immunosuppressive drug versus glucocorticoids alone. The recommendation is that there is a persistent uncertainty regarding the clinical benefit associated with combination therapy versus glucocorticoids alone. Several factors have to be considered. The severity of uh, the disease, the relapsing course of PACNS, the glucocorticoids, 
the glucocortic related toxicity. Uh, so the model working group suggests uh, to consider adding an immunosuppressant to glucocorticoid therapy in most patients with PACNS. But uh, in milder resistant phenotypes, the use of glucocorticoids alone may be considered in a multidisciplinary team with relevant expertise uh, on the disease. Uh, the big problem is that uh, there is not a definition of mild disease phenotype. Four papers uh, provided data on 300 57 patients. About an half of the patients had a definite PACNS and 58% had combined with therapy, 8% had glucocorticoids alone. Uh, it means that uh, most patients don't have any therapy. The outcomes were largely underreported and with this limitation, the rate of prolonged remission without relapses seemed to be lower in patients uh, treated with glucocorticoids alone there is a possible selection bias because mild disease phenotypes could be treated with corticosteroid alone versus more aggressive presentation treated with combination treatment. As last part of the presentation, we are addressing the differential diagnosis. The most common mimic is atherosclerosis. Atherosclerotic internal disease is usually more proximal, eccentric, and involves shorter segments than dubasculitis lesion. This is not a universal rule. There are well-documented cases of uh, atherosclerosis mimicking the high probability angiographic pattern. RCVS is a second angiographic mimic. Uh, it can be effectively distinguished uh, from PACNS using a combination of clinical features and uh, laboratory findings. This is an example of an atherosclerotic right MCA stenosis in a young patient mimicking a potential vasculitis etiology. Uh, in the left part of the slide, there is uh, an posterior review of the DSA, and the uh, right part of the slide, the axial plane reconstruction of the 3D rotational angiography. Another relevant mimic is radiation induced vascular disease. It could involve large and more vessel, and uh, it is typical a long time interval between radiotherapy and vascular disease. This is an example of a SMART syndrome in a young patient. You can see in the axial T2 flare MRI the presence of uh, diffuse uh, hyperintensity of the cortical ribbon in the occipital, temporal, and parietal lobes uh, on the right side. And in the same uh, location, T1 post contrast sequences shows uh, a clear contrast enhancement. In the right part of the slide, you can see the corresponding large artery. Uh, damage of this patient with a tight stenosis of the right MCA and uh, a small stenosis of the left MCA. Among post infective vasculitis, neurosyphilis is a classic differential diagnosis. Uh, it can cause a medium to large vessel arthritis with transmural involvement of the vessel wall and multifocal localization. This is an example on a patient with um, an acoustic semi-stroke in the territory of the right MCA and uh, PCA, and with um, tight stenosis of the right ICA terminus involving also the origin of the MCA and of the ACA. The vessel wall imaging of the same patient shows a vivid contrast enhancement, a concentric contrast enhancement, and the ICA terminus on the right side. Paricella zoster virus vasculopathy is another differential diagnosis among post infectious vasculitis. Vasculopathy is caused by transaxonal spread from afferent fibers of the the geminal ganglion and other ganglia to the arterial adventitia, and uh, following uh, the spread, uh, the transmural propagation of the virus occurs. In this example, a multifocal involvement uh, is illustrated with a stenosis of the P2 PCA on the left side and of the distal segment of the M1 MCA on the left side. In the same patient, both PCA and MCA stenosis are well depicted using DSA. In conclusion, these are our takeaway messages. This is the first international multidisciplinary guideline of PACNS. Uh, it is clear that the current diagnostic criteria are not validated and have several limitations. The global quality of the evidence is really low, and a dedicated neurovascular approach doesn't merge in the data and it is needed. Neuroimaging information uh, uh, on acquisition findings and reporting for different techniques 
uh, is rarely reported. It makes data not really comparable. New techniques, for example, the cellular imaging, are promising tools, but they need to be validated and standardized. DSA is still the gold standard for large and medium sized vessel vasculitis, and uh, it is still underused. Finally, the outcomes are underreported. This affects the evaluation of treatment effects. And the final message is that uh, for uh, managing patients with suspected PACNS, a multidisciplinary dedicated team uh, is needed. The core group of the team uh, includes vascular neurologists and neuroradiologists uh, who perform an integrated neurovascular management of the patients. Great, thank you. So I think we will go back to the poll questions now. Um, so after seeing this talk, can we answer this question again? Do normal findings on CSF analysis exclude primary angitis of the central nervous system? So now 97% um, said no, which is the correct answer. Very good. Let's move on to the next one. Does a normal MRA exclude um, large vessel primary angitis of the central nervous system? So 95% said no now, excellent. Third question. Are any of the parenchymal and vascular markers on neuroradiology, including um, vessel wall imaging, highly specific for primary angitis of the central nervous system? Yes, no, or only the high resolution vessel wall imaging? So 82% said no now, as opposed to 60% before, so getting higher. And then finally, the last question. When MRA or CTA findings are normal, is a DSA recommended? So 92% said yes. Okay, great. Seems like there's been some knowledge transfer. Um, so now we're gonna move on to our um, last speaker. Um, our last talk will feature Georgios Tsivgoulis, who is from the National and Kabodistrian University of Athens and from the University of Tennessee. He will discuss an unanswered questions and perspectives in primary angitis of the central nervous system. And I believe we will have. Yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. There's just one poll question for him. Um, which diagnostic test has an almost 100% sensitivity for diagnosing primary angitis of the central nervous system? Meningocerebral biopsy, DSA, or none? Okay, this one is, is closer. So 50% said none, almost 40% said biopsy, and 12% said DSA. Take, take it away. So uh, I would like to express my appreciation to the World Stroke Organization for the opportunity uh, to present uh, in this uh, very exciting session. Uh, this is my intellectual and financial disclosure slide. I'm going to skip uh, the introduction because already many of the aspects that I wanted to address have been discussed by the previous two speakers. Um, I just wish to uh, highlight the fact that the 
classic, uh, classical cr criteria introduced by Calabrese uh, from the Cleveland group, uh, lack of validation uh, 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 when they were proposed. And we have newer diagnostic techniques, including, including higher vessel, vessel wall imaging that were not available at the time of the introduction of this criteria. And this criteria need to be uh, updated and include uh, modern neuroimaging techniques. Also, an important consideration is uh, that uh, on DSA, one abnormality in several arteries or several abnormalities in one artery are not so specific for sinus vasculitis in contrast to alternating areas of uh, smooth wall, segmental narrowing and dilatation of cerebral arteries. Another important consideration is that uh, as I'm going to show to you the data, normal CNSF analysis does not exclude uh, CNS vasculitis. Uh, and it, it is very common also in RCVS, which is an, another important uh, diagnostic consideration uh, when we are um, facing a patient with possible CNS vasculitis. This uh, recent study that was published in Journal of Neurology highlights the results of an international online survey that was completed by neurologists, internists, and rheumatologists. And it shows that there is a great variation in current diagnostic and therapeutic practices. In different eight clinical scenarios, there was only a very fair, modest inter-rater agreement with regard to the testing that was ordered. Uh, similarly, in these scenarios, the agreement was satisfactory for uh, the initiation of glycocorticosteroids and cyclophosphamide, but less than 90%. And it was even poor for the duration of uh, treatment for maintenance therapy. And in patients who were uh, symptomatic after emission, there was a moderate agreement and um, in patients who, was, who were asymptomatic, the agreement was even lower uh, between the different clinicians. So this survey illustrates current real-world management of primary CNS vasculitis and emphasizes several areas for which physicians still lack uh, strong, robust evidence and uh, also where they're positive uh, with regard to available guidelines. So there are multiple unanswered questions. The heterogeneity of the clinical presentation of the diagnostic workup, uh, the inaccurate use of diagnostic criteria, the diagnostic yield of biopsy, which is much lower than 100%, and I'll show you the data, the same for DSA. Uh, what is the yield of CTA or MRA versus DSA? Uh, how important is CSF analysis? Can we rely on high resolution vessel wall imaging? How can we differentiate the different uh, uh, anxiety subtypes? How can we proceed with a reliable differential diagnostic between uh, cerebral amyloid angiopathy related inflammation and amyloid beta related inflammation and uh, primary sinus vasculitis? I'm going to discuss in my last slide some uh, biomarkers and imaging techniques that may be of assistance in the future. So uh, there have been three large cohorts evaluating the clinical and diagnostic findings in patients with uh, vasculitis. The Mayo cohort on the left, the French cohort in the center, and the New Delhi cohort um, in the uh, left of my screen. So uh, you can see that uh, there is not consensus with regard to the most common manifestation. Headache and cognitive dysfunction were the most common manifestation in the Mayo cohort. Headache and motor deficit were the most common uh, manifestations in the French registry. Scissors and headache were the most common manifestations in the New Delhi cohort. Uh, and if you want to see the meta-analyzed available data, uh, there is a very recent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis published in Neurology, Neuroimmunology, and Neuroinflammation, which shows that focal neurological signs and headache are the two most common manifestations. Similarly, there is substantial heterogeneity in the diagnostic workup performed in the different cohorts. DSA was performed in only 79% of patients in the Mayo cohort, uh, biopsy in 49%. In the French cohort, DSA was performed in 85%, biopsy in 47%, and the New Delhi cohort, DSA was performed in 56%, and biopsy in 68%. 
it is surprising that CSF analysis that we always perform in our clinical practice in Athens was performed only in 77% in the Mayo cohort, 93% uh, in the French cohort, similar to our experience, but only 59% in the Indian cohort. And in a systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, DSA uh, that was published in 2021, DSA was performed in 50% of the patients, MRI only in 69%. It should be performed in 100% of the patients, in all pi patients, uh, biopsy in 51% and CSF analysis in only two thirds of the patients. So uh, there is no specific marker, there is no specific diagnostic test, and unfortunately, the large cohort who have evaluated patients with CNS vasculitis had uh, incomplete uh, diagnostic workup. Although all three cohorts used the standard Calabrese slash Cleveland criteria, uh, they used different diagnostic workup in order to employ this criteria. And notably, uh, the French cohort has introduced another criterion, a duration of follow-up of more than six months in order to exclude other vasculopathies and reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So uh, although the criteria were similar, the, the different uh, diagnostic workup uh, resulted in inconsistencies in the uh, clinical implementation of this criteria. And more recent studies, uh, now use the high resolution vessel wall imaging in their criteria, although it's not part of the standard diagnostic criteria that were also discussed by uh, Mario Luisa Zede. Uh, some studies uh, in Germany adopt the German Society of Neurology criteria, which are different uh, than the Calabrese criteria, and uh, other, other uh, investigators use uh, neuroimaging criteria, new neuroimaging criteria in order to diagnose the disease. Uh, let's move on to the diagnostic yield of uh, biopsy. Uh, first of all, the threshold for perform performing uh, brain biopsy in uh, suspected primary sinus vasculitis is relatively high and it should be performed more often. The diagnostic yield is much lower than 100%, only 60 to 70%. Uh, there are uh, multiple negative findings that may be related to sampling error. Uh, uh, sampling the leptomeninges or, and the lesioned area increases the yield of the biopsy. Uh, in a recent study, uh, uh, only 5% of cases had both positive biopsy and positive DSA. So they should not be considered as equivalent tests given the lack of agreement. And they are complementary tests. And uh, many cohorts of patients include individuals who underwent brain biopsy for other reasons and not for a clinical suspicion of uh, primary sinus angiitis and the technique of a brain biopsy was suboptimal. And uh, from a histological standpoint, from a pathologic standpoint, uh, the, the, uh, it is very difficult to discriminate infectious vasculitis or systemic vasculitis from primary sinus vasculitis. Now, uh, if there, there is evidence of contrast enhanced lesions on brain MRI and uh, the biopsy is targeted to these specific lesions, this increases uh, the sensitivity of the brain biopsy. And this is an important consideration. And uh, the previous speaker has already shared with you the expert consensus statement of PICO-9 of the European Stroke Organization guidelines, which I had the privilege to serve as a mentor where the investigators suggest proceeding to biopsy when there is a clinical suspicion of uh, primary sinus angiitis and leptomeningeal enhancement and normal findings on DSA. And uh, if there is no leptomeningeal enhancement, then uh, they suggest to target the biopsy of a gadolinium enhanced lesion because it can increase the diagnostic accuracy. The diagnostic yield of uh, angiography is much lower than 100%. It varies between 70 and 88 percent, and of course, uh, angiography is typically negative in small vessel primary CNS angiitis. Uh, the differential uh, diagnosis of uh, uh, primary CNS uh, vasculitis, uh, where is uh, the, you can see the typically regular nodes appearance of ve on vessels on DSA from uh, RCVS, where the, there is a widespread one in a string appearance of vessels on DSA, it is sometimes very challenging. And 
always it is not very accurate. So uh, based on the available data, there are important uh, recommendations uh, uh, with uh, expert consensus statements that uh, you can use CTA as an alternative to MRA if there is a uh, multi-slice, more than 128 slices technique uh, available. Of course, DSA has a higher sensitivity compared to MRA and CTA. And if the MRA or CTA is not diagnostic or even normal, then we should move forward to DSA. DSA is uh, more sensitive than uh, CTA or MRA, especially for medium or distal vessel stenosis or occlusion, as shown by the French uh, anxieties cohort. The diagnostic uh, yield of CSF is sub uh, analysis is suboptimal. The sensitivity is 78%, specificity 68%, the positive predictive value is 87%, the negative predictive value uh, 54%. Uh, CSF pliocytosis is evident in only 47% of patients, and elevated CSF protein levels are, is a more sensitive marker, but it can also be false positive. It is uh, uh, abnormal in 71% uh, of our patients. But keep in mind that even in uh, normal individuals, there are many reasons where we can find uh, patients with elevated CSF protein levels. So this might be a false positive result. What about high resolution vessel wall imaging? Uh, the expert consensus statement indicates that it is a promising but not well validated technique. It should be further uh, investigated. For the time being, it should be used uh, in centers with experience on the technique and uh, strong neuroradiology services. And we use it mainly, as shown in the left on the screen in this interesting case, uh, to follow up our patients and to evaluate the treatment response in large vessel vasculitis treated with, with uh, pulse methyl methylprednisolone and cyclophosphamide. We see the strong concentric enhancement at the baseline, which is substantially attenuated three months, and then it's absent at nine months. And this is uh, important for us to uh, decide uh, uh, further uh, when we're going to uh, taper and reduce the uh, immunosuppressive treatment. Uh, the two main neuroimaging findings with high resolution vessel wall imaging is concentric thickening and vessel wall enhancement. And these are combined have a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 100% in a Turkey study that needs to be replicated in larger cohorts. An important clinical caveat is to perform DSA even in patients with uh, large multiple infarctions in different territories when the diagnosis of vasculitis is suspected even in normal, uh, even if these patients have normal DSA, as shown in this interesting case report by our center. And I wish to remind you that the concordance between biopsy, brain biopsy and DSA, in terms of true negative and true positive findings in both uh, tests is only 56%. So these are complementary examinations. Another important consideration is that the uh, when there is evidence of parenchymal or leptominial gadolinium enhancement, this increases uh, the likelihood of a positive brain uh, biopsy by eightfold. And where is there is evidence of cerebral microbleeds, this in increases the likelihood of a positive biopsy by more than fourfold. Uh, it is important that to keep in mind that parenchymal samples are more often diagnostic of uh, primary sinus anxieties, then leptomeningeal sa samples, especially in patients with lymphocytic uh, primary sinus vasculitis. Now, can we differentiate between large vessel and small vessel vasculitis? Usually patients with large vessel vasculitis are older and they have more frequently evidence of acute ischemia at presentation. In contrast, patients with small vessel vasculitis have uh, more frequently evidence of seizures, cognitive impairment, abnormal CSF analysis, gadolinium and leptomeningeal enhancement on brain MRI. Can we differentiate uh, between granula uh, granulomatous and lymphocytic primary CNS vasculitis uh, in this uh, 
a very interesting uh, study by uh, the French group, headache, uh, abnormal CSF analysis, cerebral microbleeds, acute subarachnoid hemorrhage, and multiple intracranial stenosis were more common in granulomatosus uh, primary sinus vasculitis, and also in brain uh, biopsy specimens, amyloid beta positivity was shown only in granulomatosus and in uh, no patient with uh, lymphocytic sinus vasculitis. And again, uh, impairment of cognition and uh, abnormal CSF findings were much more frequent in uh, granulomatosus uh, angiitis compared to lymphocytic uh, angiitis in a recent uh, meta-analysis. Another important uh, consideration is the differential diagnosis between primary CNS angiitis, ABRA, and CARI. And I wish to remind to our audience that ABRA is characterized by destructive vasculitic transmural, often granulomatosus, inflammatory infiltrates. In contrast, CARI is characterized by non-destructive perivascular, of often lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrates. And this can only be performed by brain biopsy. Uh, in this uh, recent study by Salvaran and co-workers, uh, it was shown that uh, compared with uh, primary sinus vasculitis, ABRA patients were older, had a higher frequency of alter cognition, seizures, gadolinium leptomeningeal enhancement, and intracerebral hemorrhage. And these were some uh, the, uh, clinical and diagnostic markers in favor of one diagnosis over the other. However, you need a brain biopsy for the definitive discrimination. And I wish to remind you the results of our recent meta-analysis evaluating the clinical and neuroimaging spectrum of CARI. Cognitive decline is much more common compared to vasculitis, and uh, and encephalopathic presentation is much more common in CARI compared to vasculitis. And also, we have a, a very high prevalence of T2 flared hyperintense white matter lesions, 98%, and a very, very high prevalence of microbleeds, 96% percent and cortificial superficial sidirosis uh, that can differentiate uh, the uh, CRI patients from vasculitis patients. Now, uh, there are many challenges with regard to the treatment of this disease. Uh, we, the current approach is based on empirical therapeutic approach of ANC-associated vasculitis that was introduced by rheumatologists. Uh, that we have no randomized control uh, uh, trials. Uh, we uh, have no evidence of uh, when to add non-steroid immunosuppressive to the induction treatment, how to select a specific immunosuppressive, the timing of corticosteroid tapering after induction treatment, and the duration of the treatment. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, therapeutic algorithm proposed by Carlo Salvarani based on clinical experience. This is what we also follow in our center in Athens. It is very important to discriminate between large vessel vasculitis, where uh, we start with induction therapy using methylprednisolone, uh, one gram per day for three to five days. And then we, we add uh, cyclophosphamide, either orally or intravenously. We prefer intravenous infusion. And uh, then there is a maintenance therapy with low dose prednisolone or uh, with azathioprine or Mycophonolate mofetil. Uh, in patients with a small vessel uh, angiitis, uh, it is proposed to start with uh, uh, induction therapy using oral or intravenous methylprednisolone. And based on the patient response, uh, you may add or not add cyclophosphamide. Uh, and uh, all these Therapeutic challenges are addressed in the expert consensus statements of PICO2 that have been shared with you uh, to you by Mar Maria Luisa Zede. And so I'm not going to repeat them for the sake of time. But I think that it's a very important thing to remember that you need to keep your patients on maintenance therapy for at least two years because there is a high risk of recurrence if you stop the corticosteroids after re re remission. A few words with regard to potential diagnostic uh, markers. Uh, this is a, an elegant study from the University Center of Hamburg-Ebendorf in Germany. It was shown that circulating endothelial cells, which are well-established markers for endothelial damage, 
or a potential biomarker in primary CNS uh, angiitis with active disease, and it can discriminate angiitis reliably from uh, healthy controls and um, RCVS. Another important uh, biomarker introduced by the same group uh, in a paper published in, in Neurology, Neuroimmunology, and Neuroinflammation in 2016 is interleukin um, 17. This is a pro inflammatory cytosine, uh, which is a potent mediator of a chemokine release, activation of endothelial surfaces, and recruitment of inflammatory cells. It has been known to play an important role in the pathogenesis of ANC associated vasculitis and giant cell vasculitis. And this study showed that um, uh, there is class to evidence in favor of an increased proportion of interleukin 17 producing CD4 positive cells in CSF patients presenting with uh, stroke symptoms. And this is a, has a, a, a moderate sensitivity, 73%, but a high specificity to discriminate vasculitis from acute stroke due to other underlying mechanisms. Uh, especially in um, childhood central nervous system vasculitis, uh, von Willebrand uh, levels have emerged as another potential uh, biomarker of this disease activity, uh, according to a, a recent study from the University of Toronto and McMaster University in Canada. Carlos Arvarani and his group have uh, conducted a recent elegant study uh, taking brain specimens of patients with granulomatous vasculitis, lymphocytic vasculitis, ABRA, and normal controls and performing RNA sequencing. Their pathway analysis revealed the activation of the dendritic cell maturation, antigen processing, as well as neuroinflammation in primary sinus vasculitis versus normal brains. Also, oxidation, oxidative phosphorylation, phosphorylation was inhibited in primary sinus vasculitis. So these are important considerations with regard to novel potential biomarkers in terms of the mechanistic processes of the disease. Finally, some promising, potentially promising neuroimaging markers or uh, 3D or 4D uh, DSA as introduced uh, by the neuroradiology group from Getty University in Frankfurt, uh, where it is shown the possibility to uh, evaluate in a very objective way the penetrators and perforators of uh, uh, basilar artery, the branches, both the circumferential branches and the penetrating branches, which may be affected in small vessel vasculitis. Similarly, this group uh, has uh, shown that uh, 4D DSA is a very reliable diagnostic tool in order to be uh, able to uh, visualize the perforators of middle cerebral artery and anterior cerebral artery in the anterior circulation. Moving now to the end of my lecture, I, we, I want to highlight some take-home messages. Uh, first of all, the currently used diagnostic criteria have been proposed before of the, uh, the development of more advanced diagnostic techniques. They need independent validation and further integration of new neuroimaging uh, markers. We need a more standardized uh, and widely used diagnostic process in the application of this criteria. Uh, I believe that uh, there is a low rate of concordance between biopsy and angiography, uh, reflecting the diversity of uh, underlying uh, vasculitis subtypes, and uh, namely small vessel and large vessel uh, vasculitis. The two subtypes have different diagnostic and neuroimaging findings and different natural history and response to treatment. This needs to be taken into consideration when we are managing these patients. And uh, we need uh, at least some randomized trials to assess the role of uh, cyclophosphamide and the currently used uh, therapies and potentially targeted immunotherapies, for instance, interleukin 6 inhibitors, uh, complement component 5 inhibitor, neonatal FC receptor inhibitor, uh, bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which may increase the treatment efficacy and safety in these patients. Uh, the most important challenge when we're managing these patients is the low diagnostic accuracy uh, of the diagnostic tests that are available currently and the complex diagnostic process that needs 
I believe, uh, vascular neurology expertise as well as neuroradiology expertise. We need multidisciplinary teams to assess our patients, as already mentioned by the previous speakers. Uh, we have to develop novel diagnostic and potentially biological and radiological markers. And I think that we need to collaborate at uh, universal levels and perhaps conduct some small RCTs to evaluate potentially novel therapies in this patient subgroup. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Let's just quickly repeat this Cole poll question. Which diagnostic test has almost 100% sensitivity? I think the answer was made pretty clear in the talk. So 75% said none, which is the correct answer. So maybe now we'll I'll hand over to Brett and we'll try and answer some of the questions in the chat. All right, well, thanks to the presenters for some wonderful talks. Uh, there were a lot of questions put in the chat that our presenters actually answered in the chat as well. So if uh, those of you who, who have some questions, you might find it interesting to go through the those and see the written answers. But I'm gonna try to just, uh, in the time we have left, maybe bring up a couple of the general themes that came through in these questions. And I think one of the one of the first ones that's really important is a question about how do you differentiate primary CNS angiitis from RCVS, atherosclerosis, and moya moya. And I think it'd be interesting to hear the presenters maybe focus a little bit on the the clinical features that might distinguish them, given that we've heard a lot about the radiographic uh, and uh, and other tests that might be used. So could one of you maybe comment on that aspect? I think that this question could be for me. Yeah. Uh, from the clinical point of view, the main differentiation between uh, PA, CNS, and uh, CDS is uh, um, the time course and the type of headache. So um, RCDS uh, is more easily characterized by uh, thundercut headache and usually by a uh, repeated thundercut headache. Uh, and uh, PA CNS usually is a uh, uh, disease with a uh, very long prodromal phase uh, with ADH2, but uh, very rarely with uh, uh, thundercup headache. Uh, the two diseases uh, uh, involve uh, different subtypes uh, of patients. So uh, it is possible that uh, um, careful investigation about uh, uh, triggers or uh, drugs as uh, triggers for uh, uh, headache or uh, vasoconstriction could be useful, but uh, unfortunately there is a, a small series published by um, some colleagues from Boston uh, with a good histopathology demonstration that uh, also in patients with PACNS could be a uh, trigger at form uh, induced by the same uh, uh, drugs uh, already known for um, RCDS. So it is not really simple to distinguish between the, the two diseases. Also adding clinical information in some cases. Uh, if I may add something, uh, it's not a clinical caveat, it's a, a neuroimaging caveat, but I think it's very important. Repeat transcranial Doppler examinations may be very useful in patients with uh, RCVS because you're going to see a gradual decrease of, of the elevated velocities if you repeat them. And this is a very easy non-invasive diagnostic test. This will never happen in uh, large vessel uh, vasculitis. Yes, I totally agree. Well, that's a nice segue into another kind of theme of some, several of the questions, uh, which centered around follow-up imaging to gauge response to therapy with some specific references to uh, will the vessel abnormalities resolve on repeat DSA, and if so, how long does it take, and can vessel wall imaging be used to follow treatment response? Yes, if I may uh, reply to that first, 
I, w- I, I prefer to use high resolution vessel wall imaging because you will see the resolution of contrast enhancement, especially in large vessel vasculitis, uh, following the combination of induction therapy with uh, uh, methylprednisolone and cyclophosphamide. And we do it at uh, baseline three, six, and then nine months. And uh, this was also the experience of the Turkish group uh, who have, they have also reported that in uh, six to twelve months, out of nine cases, seven of them had the regression of the uh, contrast enhancement on uh, high resolution vessel wall imaging. I think uh, this is a test that has no radiation, which is very important, and it's a non-invasive test compared to uh, repeat uh, DSAs in these patients. At least this is my. Uh, experience and my, the way I practice, and I'm uh, very looking forward to hear uh, your opinion, Brett, or uh, the opinion of the other speakers also. Yeah, would would uh, would you like to comment? So, uh, I basically agree with Georgios, but the main problem is when uh, the contrast enhancement uh, persists in the follow-up examination, and uh, the patient is going well. So in this case, uh, I think it is not really useful uh, nor specific uh, because uh, it has been demonstrated that uh, contrast enhancement uh, could persist for for years in these patients. So um, uh, when contrast enhancement uh, regresses during follow-up, okay, it's a good information. When it persists, I think we need other supporting information about the disease activity. Great. Uh, I remember a rheumatologist who taught me about primary CNS angiitis many years ago, insisting that every patient that you sus- strongly suspected this condition in should have brain biopsy. I know that is not a universally held view, but I'm curious how you all think about that. Do you advocate biopsy for everyone? Are there some patients you feel confident enough in the diagnosis that you don't feel it's necessary? How do you approach that question? So uh, if uh, there is a suspicion and DSA uh, is negative because at baseline we perform DSA in all suspected cases and also CSF analysis. We perform a brain biopsy. However, uh, when there are positive and specific findings on the DSA, we had some cases where there was concordance between DSA and brain biopsy, but some cases there was a negative brain biopsy and a positive DSA. So uh, these are the most challenging cases. And uh, if we have either uh, a DSA, which is positive, or a brain biopsy, which is positive, uh, then the diagnosis of uh, primary CNS vasculitis is made. Uh, For me, brain biopsy is very important to rule out mimickers. Uh, For instance, sarcoidosis or tuberculous meningitis and vasculitis. So uh, to rule out... uh, uh, CIRI, uh, we have recently reported the patients with multiple microinfractions that we were considered uh, that it was a, a case of vasculitis. In contrast, it was a CIRI and the brain biopsy was very helpful with regard to that. So I think the brain biopsy has uh, two roles, not only to confirm the diagnosis even uh, or to put the diagnosis in patients with a, a negative uh, DSA, but also to rule out other important mimickers of vasculitis. Dr. Zed, would you like to comment on that? Okay, it looks like maybe we're at the end of our time. So I think we'll we'll wrap up. Thanks very much to all the speakers uh, for the wonderful presentations. Indeed. On behalf of the WSO and the WSA, we would also like to thank our uh, all of our panelists for being here voluntarily, for contributing to this educational activity. Uh, just a reminder that uh, there will be a recorded version of this webinar shared with all of you, and you can now fill in the evaluation survey that will pop up on your screen, and you can also request a certificate of attendance for this webinar. 
As always, you can find us on LinkedIn, on X, as well as our uh, site, worldstrokeacademy.org. And we look forward to seeing you in our next educational activity. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye. Bye-bye. Nice.